welcome to Globetrotting Storytime. I'm Miss Sharon from Ventura County Library, and today we're going to travel to Chile. But before we do that, let's do our welcome song. Can you show me your hands, please? Thank you. Here, you ready? Here we go. Welcome, welcome everyone. Now it's time to have some fun. Read some stories, sing some songs. Some are short and some are long. Welcome, welcome everyone. Now it's time to have some fun. Very good, okay. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. All right, how about if we do head, shoulders, knees, and toes? So let's find our parts and pieces. Head, shoulders, can you find knees? That's right, and then can you find toes? Toes, very good. So here we go, you ready? One, two, three. Head, shoulders, knees, and toes knees and toes, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes, eyes and ears and mouth and nose, head, shoulders, knees and toes, knees and toes. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Shake it out, shake it out, shake it out, shake it out. So today we are traveling to Chile. There you go. And so, I'm gonna come a little closer. We can see Chile is a very long country. It is actually the longest country in the world. I have here sort of a close up. People live sort of toward the middle of the country. Most people live there. Um, but it, and it borders along Peru, Bolivia, and Argentina in the continent of South America. It's very, very long and not very wide. In some areas, it's so close, it's like between Ventura and Santa Barbara. It's like that's how wide little parts of the country are, or only even 100 miles. Average is 100 miles across. So, now it is 2,700 miles long. A little bit under 2,700 miles long. 2,700. Yep, and so we're gonna find it on our map. Here's our map of the world. Look at all the places we visited with Globe Trotting Story Time. So many. So we are going to find now. Here's us in California, in the United States of America, and we are in the continent of North America. We're gonna travel to South America, way down here. And you can see we've already been to Brazil and Peru and Colombia. And now we're going to go down to Chile. There's Chile. And let's mark off. Remember, it's a very, very long country. So we're going to take off all of this part along the west coast. The west coast of Chile. Look at how long of a country that is. It goes all the way down to the bottom. And you know what? They also have islands as territories. So these islands, we're gonna scratch off for these islands. And we are going to scratch off the Easter Islands. That's gonna be important later on. Easter Islands have so many statues on them. We're gonna show you pictures of that later. So look at, there's Chile all the way down. So we know that when we travel, we like to be able to say hello, right? And so in Chile, they speak Spanish, 90 something percent of the population speaks Spanish. And so we know how to say hello, hola, but a lot of times greetings um, are a little more formal and they depend on the time of day that you say them. So for example, we have good day, good afternoon, 
good night. So we have buenos dias, buenas tardes, and buenas noches. So can you say buenos dias? Buenos dias. And then if that's for good, good day, how about good afternoon? Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. And then how about good night? Buenas noches. Buenas noches. So uh, you can say hello in the day, in the afternoon, or in the evening. So I want to show you a few pictures. In Chile, on this side, the side that it meets with Argentina and Bolivia and Peru, are the Andes Mountains, run along the back, and there's some dry desert in that area. In fact, the Atacama Desert, that's a picture of that, is one of the Earth's driest places, and sometimes they get no rain for years and years and years and years and years. Look at that. And there's the Andes Mountains in the background, the longest mountain chain that's above water. Next to the deserts, then it becomes sort of prairie and grassland. Do you see that? Look at the prairie and the grassland. That's where uh, more animals can live. Do you see this little animal here? <gasps> that's a guanaco. It's in the pampas or the grasslands of Patagonia. They have four kinds of camel, of animals from the camel family, guanacos, llamas, alpacas, and vicuñas. It's nice to know the animals of a place, isn't it? Our first story today is about a person that's very famous. His name is Pablo Neruda. He's a very famous person, poet from Chile. And he wrote all about, in, in a lot of his poetry, he wrote about all the wonderful things, the wonderful natural things that are a part of Chile. So he's a good example that we can uh, use to tell us all about what Chile is like. And we want to thank um, Henry Holt and Company from Macmillan Publishers for permission to read this story. The book is authored by Monica Brown and illustrated by Julie Pashkis. So thank you to all of them who wrote the book and painted the pictures and published it. It's called Pablo Neruda, Poet of the People. Look at that. Once, there was a little boy named Neftali who loved wild things wildly and quiet things quietly. From the moment he could talk, Neftali surrounded himself with words that whirled and swirled just like the river that ran near his home in Chile. Neftali loved to play in the forest ride horseback, and swim in the river with his friends. His father was a train conductor, and sometimes he would take his son with him on the train. Whenever the train made a stop, Neftali would run off into the forest to search for beetles and birds' eggs and tall ferns that dripped water like tears. This is an example of something that's called the Enchanted Forest in Chile. He loved to be inspired by his country. Now, Neftali wasn't very good at soccer or throwing acorns like his friends, but he loved to read and discover magic between the pages of books, just like us. A very special, special teacher named Gabriela Mistral gave him wonderful books from faraway places, and Neftali decided he wanted to be a writer too. He loves writing so much they decorated all the pages with words from his poems. 
When he was a teenager, he changed his name to Pablo Neruda and began publishing his poems. He always wrote in green ink, the color of the ferns in the forest and the grass beneath his feet. Pablo moved to the big city of Santiago and met other writers. Together, Pablo and his friends walked the streets wearing great black capes. Do you see those big capes? And tall hats. They talked about books and shared their poems with all who would listen. Pablo wrote poems about the things he loved, things made by his artist friends found at the marketplace and things he saw in nature. He wrote about scissors and thimbles and chairs and rings. He wrote about buttons and feathers and shoes and hats. He wrote about velvet cloth, the color of the sea. Look at how many things you can see. Do you see the clocks? Yeah? And these are all the words that he used to describe all these things in his poem. Rings and artichokes and watermelon. So many things to see in this book. Pablo loved opposites. So he wrote about fire and rain and spring and fall. Do you see there's some opposites in these two pictures? In this, this is the sun, yes, and this is the moon. So that means this must be daytime and this is nighttime. So those are opposites. Look, we have a dog in this picture and a cat in this picture. We have bees that fly around in the day in this picture and fireflies that fly in the night. So he loved opposites. Here's another opposite. If I point this way, I'm going up. And what is the opposite way? <gasps> going down. Very good. You know all your opposites. In the streets and with his friends, Pablo saw joy and sadness. So he wrote about both. They're kind of opposite feelings, aren't they? Joy and sadness. Although sometimes we feel joy and sadness at the same time. But they are opposite feelings. Pablo loved the stones of Chile. He wrote about stones rolled by waves onto the beach and stones polished by sand and salt. He wrote about stones tumbling down the mountaintops and stones in the hands of stone cutters. Do you remember we talked about Easter Island way off in the ocean? Way, way off in the ocean that is a territory of Chile? He was inspired by, on that island, Easter Island, there are so many statues that were carved, almost 900 statues. So it's a place that people love, love, love to visit, to see these special statues that were carved by people long, 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 long ago. Easter Island is also called Rapa Nui and it's a volcanic island too, a very interesting place to visit. And you can see how he was inspired to write poetry about them. Pablo loved the sea and the feel of the sand beneath his feet. He loved walking along the beach near his home in Chile. He found starfish and seaweed, red crabs and green water. He saw dolphins playing in the surf and rusty anchors washed ashore. We talked about how it's a very long, thin country, and so a good portion of it is coastline. And like this, where there's lots of pebbles and rocks and boulders, and he was inspired to write poetry about all the things he saw. Pablo wrote about children who played in the sea foam and the sand, skipping stones and chasing waves. He wanted each child to share in Chile's wealth and hope. He had many homes and sometimes he lived in Spain, half a world away. So that's, Spain is in Europe on the other side of the world. 
his home there was called House of Flowers because of the red flowers blooming from every corner. The House of Flowers was always filled with dogs and people, young and old, because above all things and above all words, Pablo Neruda loved people. He, Pablo loved mothers and fathers, poets and artists, children and neighbors, and his many friends around the world. He opened his arms to them all. In his country of Chile, Pablo saw coal miners were working in dangerous jobs for little money, and he was, and that made him angry. When he saw that they were cold and hungry and sick, he decided to share their story so that he could hopefully help them make a better life. He joined with those who fought for justice and wrote poems to honor all workers who struggled for freedom. Even when his poems made leaders angry, he would not be silent. He was a poet of the people. Soldiers came to get him and he hid in the homes of friends and then escaped on a horse over the mountains of Chile. Remember those big tall mountains, the Andes Mountains? He rode his horse through them. He was brave. He wasn't afraid to share the story of Chile with the world. Pablo's voice was heard across nations and oceans. From his poems grew flowers of hope and dreams of peace. And there he is pictured as an older gentleman. Pablo Neruda, poet of the people. So not only did we get to hear about his life, we got to hear all about what Chile is like with all its ocean and mountains and desert and grasslands. We got to hear about it all, didn't we? Okay, well, do you remember that he loved going to the ocean? What lives in the ocean? What lives in the ocean? Oh, maybe sharks, yeah, what else? Fish, that's right, all kinds of creatures. Well, I have a fish puppet for us today. And we're gonna do a song called, Did You Ever See a Fishy? Okay, let's see, it goes like this. Did you ever see a fishy, a fishy, a fishy? Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that? Swim this way and that way and that way and this way. Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that? <laughs> Do you wanna try that with your hands? So let's try. Did you ever see a fishy, a fishy, a fishy? Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that? Swim this way and that way and that way and this way. Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that? Should we try with one more puppet friend? Let's see. Do I have, <gasps> ooh, it's a different color fish. Did you ever see a fishy, a fishy, a fishy? Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that? Swim this way and that way and that way and this way. Did you ever see a fishy swim this way and that. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Okay, let's get our wiggles out. Um, how about this? I wiggle my fingers. Can you wiggle your fingers? I wiggle my toes. Can you wiggle your toes? I wiggle my shoulders. And I wiggle my nose. And now all my wiggles are all out of me. And I can sit <laughs> for our next story. Well, our next story actually starts out with, I wanna talk about, oh, the food of Chile is amazing. Look at this. So down here, we have something called ceviche. It's fish that instead of cooked with heat, is cooked with the juice from citrus, like lemon or lime. That's a dish that everyone eats there because they have a lot of fish because they a lot of the country is right on the edge of the ocean. Oh, then we have these. Some people may recognize these. They look very much like tamales, but their version is called umitas, and it's from the Andean 
indigenous cultures, and they're but they are instead of spicy, they're more on the sweet side, made with sweet basil and fresh corn, not corn flour like masa like we do in in tamales, but it's fresh corn, and then instead of steaming, they boil them, so they look the same, but they're a little bit different. It's fun to see how different people make different recipes for things, right? Now this is fun. This is a stew. It's a cazuela. And it's usually broth with meat and pumpkin and corn and potatoes and cilantro. And if you want to eat it Chilean style, you, you sip or you drink or you eat the broth first. And then you cut up all the things in the broth and eat those separate. I've never eaten soup that way. I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna try a stew, eating stew that way. And this last one looks very familiar. What would you think of that is right here? You're right, it's a hot dog. So, but they don't call theirs hot dogs. They um, more call them so their word for sausages. This is called a completo. Completo is sausage and fresh tomato and sauerkraut. That's pickled and fermented cabbage. And then mayonnaise. We put lots of different things on what we would call hot dogs. And so this is their version called the completo. There is something though that I wanna show you. It is our next story and it's about empanadas. So this is the empanadas that Abuela made. Abuela is the word in Spanish for grandma. And Abuelo is grandpa, we're gonna meet him too. We have permission to read this from Arte Publico Press. And the author is Diane Gonzalez Bertrand, and the illustrations are by Alex Pardo DeLang. And there's something special I'll show you on the inside. These are the empanadas that Abuela made. I want you to look carefully at the shape of them. Many, many places in South and Central and even North America make a version of empanadas and they're all a little bit different. So take a look at the shape of these and we'll talk about it after. So, oh, they did their empanadas and they have leche, milk, and they also have sugar and flour, harina, and azúcar. that's right. And, oh, grandma's making pumpkin or calabaza empanadas. This is the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. Look at that. This is the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. I think they're exaggerating. <laughs> This is the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. And these are the grandchildren who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. It's fun to cook with people all together because oh, sometimes you get to lick the spoons. This is Abuelo, this is Grandpa, who hugs the grandchildren who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. Oh, here is the dog, El Perro. This is the dog that follows Abuelo who hugs the children who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. These are the cousins, los primos, who chase the dog that follows Abuelo, who hugs the children, who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. Oh! And here is the family, la familia, 
who come with the, who comes with the cousins who chase the dog that follows up Wello, who hugs the grandchildren who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that abuela made and here she is who do you think this is that's right this is abuela who feeds the family who comes with the cousins, who, that, who chase the dog that follows Abuela, who hugs the grandchildren, who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. Oh, we have another. Look at everyone's enjoying the empanadas with leche, with milk. This is the milk poured by Abuela who feeds the family who comes with the cousins, who chase the dog, that follows Abuelo, who hugs the grandchildren, who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough, that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. And look at this. These are the happy faces, las caras felices, who eat the empanadas and drink the milk, poured by Abuela, who feeds the family, who comes with the cousins, who chase the dog that follows Abuelo, who hugs the grandchildren, who push the rolling pin that rolls out the dough, that folds over the pumpkin for the empanadas that Abuela made. Uh, and this is Abuela, who dreams of the happy faces. And this is the end where there's a recipe for pumpkin empanadas, both in English and in Spanish. This is a bilingual book. I hope you borrow it someday. Remember at the beginning of the story, I said, notice the shape of the empanadas. See, they are semicircles or half a circles or sometimes called moon shaped. And that's many places make their empanadas like that. But in Chile, it's different. Look at this. It is more of a rectangle. So their empanadas look a little different. And in their pastries, while they eat them both savory and sweet, and sometimes they're full of cheese or seafood, these ones are a national food uh, that they make, well, any time of year, but they especially eat them at the Fiesta Patrias. And it is a pino, a pino empanada, made with ground beef and olive and egg and onion and so even when different places in the world have similar foods, sometimes each nation or each people have a different, slightly different way of doing it. So the shape, the half moon shape, and then in Chile, it's a more of a rectangle. The empanadas that Abuela made. Okay. Well, the last thing we're going to show you is the Chilean flag. What are the colors in the flag? Red, white, and blue with a star. That's right. So let's do our rainbow fun song and then you can tell me what shapes match the flag. Let's think about that. Here we go. I know the colors of rainbow fun. Green like a frog and yellow like the sun. Orange like a pumpkin, white like the snow. A ruby red apple and a jet black crow. Purple like a flower, brown like a bear. A little pink pig and a blue shirt to wear. Okay, and what ones go with the flag? The blue shirt with the blue. The apple with the red. And the snow with the white. Very good. Well, thanks for traveling to Chile with me today. We want to do a goodbye song. I want to show you. This is ciao. A lot of times in Argentina, instead of saying um, goodbye, which is adios, they sometimes say ciao. And in Argentina, they speak very fast. And some people, just like we say bye-bye really fast in English, they say ciao, ciao. So we're going to replace our goodbye song, goodbye, with... Ciao, ciao, today. So let's get started, get your hands ready. We wave good, oop, I almost said it. I need to start again, because I want to do ciao, ciao, instead of goodbye. 
we chow chow like this. We chow chow like that. We clap our hands for all our friends. We say chow chow like this. We wave chow chow like this. We wave chow chow like this. We clap our hands for all our friends. We wave chow chow like this. So it's summer, everyone. Look at our Ventura County Library webpage, sign up for the and register for the summer reading program and stop by your local branch for STEAM kits. We'll see you soon. Bye-bye.